Money is a coordination system in a sense. It decides when there is a scarcity of resources, who gets how much of what resource. But there are probably a million or a billion different possible coordination systems, right? And most likely thousands of better coordination systems than what we have today. So it's about time to reinvent money. We have financial crisis for more than 5,000 years now. We are always running into the same traps. We have the debt spirals and it doesn't work. And still we do it again and again and again. Now, with the Internet of Things and blockchain technology, for example, we can really reinvent money and how it works. We can have the new coordination system, which is multidimensional, real time, much more functional. It can support the creation of self-organizing and self-governing systems. Welcome to Fringe FM, the podcast that explores the edges of human understanding and looks at the technologies, trends, and societal norms shaping our collective future. Here, the world's top minds share their insights and predictions on the convergence, direction, and ethics of exponential technologies transforming life as we know it. You can learn more and stay up to date at fringe.fm. Knowledge is power. That's why in so many sci-fi books and movies, you see a focus on crystal balls. Even in today's world, you see many people falling for would-be magic because we would like to know what's coming next and how can I take advantage of it. While this is used to take advantage of people in many instances, there are people that are looking on a broader frame to be able to project and forecast the future. The economists, the futurists, the thinkers, leaders, these are the people creating that world. And today we're interviewing Professor Dirk Helbing, someone who's tried to define and analyze the world of forecasting and predictions. Dirk's a professor at ETH in Zurich, the chair of sociology on modeling and simulation at ETH Zurich. He's also the scientific coordinator of the future ICT flagship proposal, a system where they're trying to create, in all practical purposes, a crystal ball for the world, taking in inputs globally, primarily via individuals and IoT devices, to be able to better understand and manage the central nervous system that is our planetary pulse. The core of the system is a computational machine to model global scale systems, economies, governments, cultural trends, epidemics, agriculture, you name it. It's a very, very ambitious project, in addition to predicting the future, so to speak. In our wide-ranging conversation, we'll also cover how science fiction impacts our worldview, the problems with today's economic model and how we need to fix that, why blockchain is incredibly interesting and has the potential to transform society, how artificial intelligence and human creativity can coexist and even thrive why we need better governance and incentive systems to sustainably survive the coming years, the big problem with connectivity and monitoring, and what Dirk's thinking, why Dirk's team is focused on building a universal human brain, the pros and cons of capitalism, socialism, and something else entirely, and much, much more. And now, without further ado, I give you Professor Dirk Helbing. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I see a lot of similarities with Asimov's The Foundation and uh, Harry Seldon's work on looking into predicting the future. So can you tell me a little bit more about how you got into this odd and interesting field? That Yeah, look, this is funny. In fact, when I was young, kind of um, 18, 19, 20 years, I wrote a short story. And in fact, I was going into this direction. And at that time, I didn't know Asimov's um, psychohistory. So somehow there was already in me. <laughs> and now it's coming out in a sense. Uh, since then, I've studied physics and complex systems, uh, crowds and traffic, how to overcome congestion, and also disasters, how to solve the world's sustainability problems, uh, how to support cooperation in society and all these kind of things. Yeah, somehow, I was always interested in this. And as I said, I started as a physicist and I was driven towards traffic science and became a sociology professor here at ATI Zurich in Switzerland. And uh, sociology is a pretty slow field, I would say, as compared to physics. And so I saw we should go big and uh, we should do something with data. And at that time, I proposed a visioneer project which was a kind of forerunner of the so-called future ICT project that was proposing to build a planetary nervous system and a living earth simulator and many more things, in fact. 
And so the people got very excited about it. And we were running for a big research grant in the European Union. It was about 1 billion euros, <laughs> believe it or not. And we were in the final round and actually we were the most popular project, a lot of press reporting about it and so on. And in fact, this was about trying to understand what is going on in the world and what's going wrong and why and how to fix it. So at that time, I was often saying, actually, we know more about the universe than about the planet we're living on. And that needs to change. We have all those certain projects that means the particle collider near to Geneva. We have fusion projects. Um, we, we have all sorts of billion dollar projects, human genome projects, you name it, you know. But we haven't had such a project really to understand society and our economy and how to improve it. And I said, let's do it. Let's launch something like an Apollo project for society. Let's create something like an innovation accelerator. And that is what the Future ICT project was about. And we created interdisciplinary research communities around the globe. That means social scientists would work with natural scientists and engineers, including, of course, computer scientists, in order to address the grand challenges of humanity. And uh, we had more than 25 countries on board, including the United States, and uh, including more than 20 European countries, including Singapore, uh, China, Russia. We're also interested in Israel, Australia, and so on. So, yeah, that was... A global project in the making and unfortunately in, in the end we didn't get uh, the financial support for this but a lot of the ideas actually took off and but today we have data science and computational social science and global system science and we have so-called exploratories that would allow us to learn more about certain kind of systems and um, have early say early warning systems and these kind of things and yeah a lot of things have happened anyway just the thing that worries me that uh, with the digital revolution also, we seem to have lost a lot of our freedoms and human dignity is at risk, I would say. Democracy is in a difficult time, and so we need to talk about this. Spoken like a true Swiss. I was living in Switzerland for quite a while, and I can completely agree. It's especially bad on the, it's not especially bad on the U.S. side of things. So you're bringing together the world's smartest minds as opposed to just having experts where when you have experts in a particular field, they're kind of worthless because they can't think outside the box. When you bring together people from essentially around the world and all expertise, then you're able to more effectively build more or less uh, a genius neural net. Something along those lines for creativity? Yes, absolutely. So I believe in collective intelligence. I would mean uh, bringing together the ideas and knowledge of many people, but also artificial intelligence systems. So we're skeptical about this idea to have one giant super intelligence that would uh, basically rule the planet and tell us what to do. Some people seem to be believing in such a thing. So they basically say, we dumb humans are not smart enough anymore to understand the problems that we have created. And so we need super intelligent systems and they are now becoming ever more intelligent in an exponential fashion and sooner or later, if not already, uh, they're overtaking human intelligence and maybe other capabilities as well. And so they will be able to understand our problems. Uh, they will be fixing our problems. They will tell us what we have to do and we just have to do it. And so basically the super intelligence would be like an AI god almost. Um, there would be a totalitarian system in a sense. And we see one instance of this probably in China, where we have a social citizen score now, where everything that people do or don't do would give them plus or minus score. And so all of that is based on mass surveillance, 20,000 terabytes of data, if I remember well. Um, don't fix me to this number, please. Uh, this is the uh, amount of data that's being collected every single day about all the Chinese citizens, and so if you cross the road when there's a red light, or if you pay your rent of the apartment a few days later, or if you don't visit your 
and randomly frequently oh, enough. No. Yes, or it's like if a you read scenario. Uh, absolutely, if you read critical news, if you have the the wrong circle of friends, and all of this, you know, would give you minus points, and then your overall score determines how much you have to pay for your loan, uh, what jobs you can have, what services you would get, what would be the conditions for these services. Uh, would you get a visa for certain countries or not? So which countries could you visit or not? All of this, basically. So it's a pretty totalitarian system driven by data. It's a feudalistic system at the same time. So a layered system where those people on top basically get everything, even if there's a scarcity of resources, they would just have everything. And where the people on the bottom may not get certain essential things for life. And we don't have access to certain kind of things. And so everyone would just have to do what this AI system tells them to do. Otherwise, they're just uh, scoring badly and basically they lose access to all those important things that we need for life in perspective. So if we run into situations where resources get scarce, and that is basically expected to happen in a non-sustainable world as we have it today, if we don't change the system, that's what I'm demanding. I'm saying, oh, look, optimization is not going to save us. What we also have to do is we have to be much more creative and innovative and basically unleash the power of our ideas and uh, create mass innovation and support collective intelligence. And that requires what we call uh, digital democracy. That means a digital upgrade of democracy platform where people would exchange their arguments about a certain complex problem to be solved. And uh, where all of these arguments would be structured into different perspectives, into a certain logic, and AI systems could probably help with that. And once we have figured out whether all the essential arguments to be considered, uh, whether the different perspectives and interests that have to be considered, then we would have round table with the leading representatives of those different perspectives uh, could be a virtual round table or a real one and the purpose of that would be to find innovative integrated solutions to that complex problem now the interesting thing is uh, complex problems require always to combine different points of view so one point of view will never give you a good solution the other interesting point is if you combine the best individual solution proposed by anyone or an organization, if you combine that very best individual solution with, say, the second best and the third best, you would think this would deteriorate the, uh, the solution. So traditionally, we would think it's not a good idea to combine the best idea with something else. <laughs> but it turns out when it comes to complex problems, that would often produce a solution that is actually considerably better than the best individual solution. That means diversity wins. Uh, the combination of different ideas is really essential to come up with solutions that work for many people in a complex world. And that's why collective intelligence is the right solution approach. Having different perspectives is not a bad thing. It's improving situations. So just suppose Humanity would be something like a hologram where information is stored in a distributed way. And we are all part of the storage that basically keeps the knowledge of the world in our brains, right? It's distributed over our brains, but everyone has a kind of different focus. And so we are all part of a global network of intelligence in a way. And I think it's, it's a good thing. Like uh, having many intelligence, um, intelligent beings like us would mean that we all learn certain aspects of reality would be, would be good solutions. And then we could combine this. If we had just one giant giga brain and would learn in a centralized way, it would take much longer actually until the learning converges to a solution. And in the meantime, maybe the world has already changed, right? So maybe the super intelligence system would actually be trapped in its old thinking and would be not um, adapting flexibly enough to changes as they always happen in our world. And I think that's one of the many reasons why distributed intelligence as we have it, as the people, is a good thing. 
And of course, we can support that with AI systems, and that's what we should be doing. How do we move towards a world that's more aligned with that? And based off of that, it sounds like you're very much must be a proponent of blockchain or a lot of the projects that are going on. So take that as you will. Yeah, I personally think that's a good uh, approach to have distributed systems. Uh, we are certainly now in a phase where humanity is undergoing a fundamental transformation of the way we are organizing ourselves. Um, that concerns the financial system, our economy, and society all together. This is called digital transformation or digital revolution even. Uh, it will be probably at least as big as the industrial revolution that happens on a much shorter time scale. It will be all encompassing. So all economic sectors most likely will be affected. All institutions in our society will be affected. Everything will change. And that can be a good thing. I'd like to put a quick pause here and point out that when dealing with scientists and future thinkers in general, we have a tendency to be optimistic. Why else try to build and create a better future if we don't think we can actually achieve it? That said, there are inherently some that would say that this is a bit pie in the sky or too utopian to consider. We'll get into some of the negative consequences of this digital transformation and where we are headed as a society and species. But I think it's important to be able to highlight both the pros and the cons of what's happening. But of course, technology um, has potential side effects and we need to be aware of the risks in order to avoid mistakes. Now, in these times of change, unexpected things will happen for sure. And uh, the best thing that we can do to prepare for this is basically create a resilient society. That means a society that is capable of dealing with unexpected developments, even crises and disasters, by responding to these unexpected developments. And we know basically what helps to improve resilience. And this is diversity, for example and also decentralization. Now, diversity is a driver of innovation, of collective intelligence, as I said before, and also of societal resilience. Now, let's come to the point of decentralization. And here we go. Yes, uh, blockchain is actually a possible solution over here. So it's not the first instance, of course, of decentralized systems. So uh, we've seen BitTorrent systems beforehand. But those systems were not um, good platforms to build trust among people. And of course, uh, we would like to live in a trustable digital society. And so we need mechanisms that would establish trust. Reputation is one such mechanism and blockchain is one such mechanism. And I think it's pretty powerful and can be used really in very many different sectors of our economy and society, and maybe also to fix the internet and um, to ensure that we get back control over our personal information, I mean, to implement informational self-determination. And um, from that point of view, blockchain is a pretty powerful solution. And we are proposing to combine it with the Internet of Things. Uh, and that's why we are running so-called BIOTS workshops and summer schools and so on. Why is this important? Because we need to solve the sustainability issue. We are currently overusing renewable resources in the world and on the long run that will bring us into terrible trouble. So uh, to, to speak openly, if we don't fix it, we would have terrible wars, maybe revolutions, maybe pandemics, whatever. So we don't really want to experience this. If you find blockchain and decentralization interesting, you will really enjoy this. Dirk has a very unique perspective given his research and has a lot to add uh, to the conversation when it comes to decentralization, organizations, governance, society as a whole. It's very interesting and a very worthwhile route. But there is a solution. And the solution is to create a circular economy and a sharing economy. And... We couldn't reach that actually by regulation, but we could reach it by technology. That's what I believe. So there is so-called DAOs, um, distributed autonomous organizations using blockchain technology that would help us uh, actually build distributed forms of organization and push forward towards semi-automated uh, processes as they're also needed for based management, recycling, and all these kinds of things. So what we're basically suggesting is the following. 
use the Internet of Things to measure the effect of human action and behavior on the environment and on other people. This is called externalities, external effects, basically. And they're good ones and bad ones, yes? How do we create the incentive structure? So it's very obvious we should be doing that. But at the same time, it's like, I can have my pizza today. I don't want to think about what it's going to do to my waste tomorrow kind of deal. That seems to be a lot of how humanity's humanity's handling this situation. Right. So the first thing is to measure the impact, right? Like uh, noise, CO2, and all sorts of waste, um, like plastic and glass and aluminum and so on and so on. And, and also things that maybe we, we don't want to experience. And the good things too, like um, education and health and reuse of resources and so on. And so based on those measurements, we would give those things a value or a price. And uh, in this way, we would create incentives. And in contrast to the money system of today, which is one dimensional, we would create multi dimensional incentives. I mean, a multi dimensional money system in a sense, if you want, or in a sense, it's also not money anymore. It's, it's a coordination system, a real time feedback and coordination system that helps us to do the right thing. And in contrast to the information systems of today that are trying to nudge us to, to do one particular thing, these systems would offer us a variety of possibilities. So there would be much more degrees of freedom for choice and also creativity, innovation. And this is the good thing, actually, because it's the combinatorial innovation that unlocks unused potentials that we haven't even realized in the past. So to summarize, Dirk's proposing a radical new system where we value individuals and contributions based not solely on financial or economic impact, but on a variety of factors. So if you're staying home looking after your parents, you're a stay-at-home mom with three kids, you're cleaning up the park after a sports game, you're helping companies reduce emissions, etc. There are all of these externalities that don't get factored in that are incredibly valuable and important to society. Dirk's proposing trying to find systems where we can better incentivize these. There are some communities that are exploring this, specifically related to blockchain. There's also several communities in Japan that have focused effort on helping seniors in the community, and you're able to essentially trade favors for helping each other's parents. While this may or may not be the economic models we pursue in the future, it is interesting to look into different perspectives outside of pure capitalism and how we could more effectively coordinate society towards aligning our goals. And um, that is really the entire difference. So I believe that will be a system that brings together freedom with um, democracy and participation and um, ecological and social aspects. And this is, I think, exactly what we want and what we need. We would get feedback about the impact of the potential actions that we might want to take. And so, yeah, we would uh, be helped basically to take better decisions, but we would be punished um, in contrast to the citizens' core system for doing this or that. I mean, in particular, in, in situations of crisis, as we may face them in the future when resources get short, as we say, in, in, in the, you need to be inventive. You need to be using resources in creative and in unusual ways. And the citizen score doesn't allow us to do it, but the system that I just described will allow us to do exactly this. So it gives us all the freedom and it gives us the information that we need. Uh, the other point, of course, is that we would need to unlock the potential of data. At the moment, of course, there's a lot of big data, but it's in the hand of very few companies and secret services and the military. And even scientists have difficulties often to get access to good and big data and even more so the citizens of our society so we need to learn to unlock the potential of this data and uh, we that means opening up data of course there are certain risks if you just open up all the data for everyone it can also be terribly misused but you could have a qualification system basically where those people who demonstrate by the way they're using the data and the function functionality that um, they're provided, I mean, the kind of operations that they can execute on the data, 
um, based on this, they could be promoted to the next level. So it would be basically a qualification system. And on the next level, you would have access to a larger volume of data and uh, more different kinds of functionality. So you have a, a more powerful access. And uh, if you demonstrate that you know how to deal with the system reasonably and responsibly, you would just be promoted to the next level. And everyone who does this, that means use data in, in reasonable and beneficial ways, uh, we climb up this ladder and have more and more opportunities unlocked with the data that's anywhere around, uh, which just hasn't been opened up to us. The other point is I think that we need to strengthen informational self-determination. So we are not becoming victims of manipulation of companies that know so much about us that it's easy for them to trick us to to buy certain kind of products or to vote um, for certain political parties or people or have certain kinds of opinions. So we're losing our freedoms. We're being guided in our thinking. And I think um, it becomes ever more difficult to think out of the box and to be creative and come up with something really new. And that cannot be good for society. This is Attention Economy 101. This is the problem. If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And as we've seen today with Facebook, Google, and many of the other large social media and networking platforms, people who've seemingly got quite a bit of value for free are finding that their personal liberties are compromised, their data is being leaked, people are getting hacked, information is getting stolen. And it's becoming incredibly challenging, both in terms of being manipulated with filter bubbles and with finding only information which corresponds to the views you want to see, to straight up outright lies and fake news, which helped elect a president. That's an entirely different story. We don't need to jump into that now. But what, what we're bringing up here, what Dirk's bringing up here is incredibly important to think about and has large future implications for how we function as a society. I believe we need to be more creative in the future as our Artificial intelligence systems and robots are taking over more and more of our routine work. And that means we'll have to change our kind of work towards more creative work and will be more fun. I think um, we'll be doing interesting projects together with other people, uh, projects um, in an economic context, social projects, ecological projects, cultural projects. And some of these projects we might be the coordinator and in others we might be just contributors to make the project succeed. Once the project is finished, we'll start a new project. Um, this is how we'll basically improve our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our society all together. Dirk's got a really interesting idea we're about to jump into in a second on the potential future for taxation and what it looks like on a local and global representation base. It's very interesting what he proposes, and this is something that I see has massive potential and is being implemented by some existing blockchain technologies, but it's not something that has been done well and has the potential to really disrupt the governmental model. And I propose that we should have crowdfunding for all based on an investment premium that would allow us really to crowdfund those projects. So investment premium would be money that would be put on our bank account, a special new kind of money. But it's not for but not for our consumption, but it's to be given to other people who have great ideas, who want to promote innovations, who engage in social or ecological projects and or in neighborhood projects. And there would be money for this. So besides the venture capitalists, the crowd could actually invest money into the project that they consider important in this way also new kinds of innovation that are not compatible with our old system would have more chances so suppose somebody would come up with an entirely new way of producing energy in a decentralized way suppose we could uh, easily produce energy as we need it at home right uh, currently most likely those uh, big energy companies wouldn't be interested in such um, new energy production scheme. So the venture capital would not be given for this energy to go ahead, the energy production system. But the crowdfunding could really make sure that those innovative solutions uh, would have a chance and that we would uh, progress much faster as society and economy and culture and humanity towards the goals that uh, we have. So. That's the idea. And and how to do that? Yes, basically reinvent um, the central banks. You know, the central banks should be serving the people. Uh, money should be 
used or and uh, should be functioning in a way to serve the people. Money is a coordination system in a sense. It decides when there is a scarcity of resources, who gets how much of what resource, but there are probably a million or a billion different possible coordination systems, right? And most likely thousands of better coordination systems than what we have today. So it's about time to reinvent money. We have financial crisis for more than 5,000 years now. We are always running into the same traps. We have the debt spirals and it doesn't work. And still we do it again and again and again. Now, with the Internet of Things and blockchain technology, for example, we can really reinvent money and how it works. We can have a new coordination system, which is multidimensional, real time, much more functional. It can support the creation of self-organizing and self-governing systems. It can support uh, the projects that I was talking about. It would allow everyone to be kind of rich in a different way, in their way. Everyone could go the the way that fits best to their talents and wouldn't be forced to subdue their life to making money, right? The one kind of money that we have today, which restricts us considerably in the way what we can actually do, how much time we can spend on certain kind of things. So yes, let's free ourselves from the bondage of the past, of the old systems that we have, using digital technology that can really be used to the benefit of humanity and every single person can give us more freedom. And um, the point here is basically that if we want to have more freedom, it also means that we have to stop telling other people what they have to do in their life. People who might be living hundreds or thousands of kilometers away. So today we have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of laws and regulations, and they're basically restraining what we can do and telling us what we have to do and how to do it and all these kind of things. Um, and I think this is limiting our creative opportunities quite considerably. And it's not useful in particular in a situation where we really have to come up with new solutions in order to solve our existential problems. While it's all nice in theory, we get down to the politics in a sec, looking at how this could actually be implemented and some of the inherent challenges based off society. One thing I would have liked to have brought up with Dirk that I didn't think of during the time was the thought of these social structures and rules that we have around people. A lot of that is also geared primarily towards young people and to what they pursue. Our education system, as it currently stands, is designed to spray out factory workers, desk workers, and productive little robots. We have yet to evolve into a more creative and fulfilling system of education. This is something I would have liked to ask Dirk as a professor at one of the top universities in the world, ETH in Zurich, what his thoughts were on the future of education and how we could more effectively give people the freedom to pursue the topics and innovations that they're most drawn to. It sounds like, it sounds like you would categorize yourself a bit as a libertarian and a bit as a socialist, <laughs> which are very uh, false dichotomy. No, I, I I think it's really important that we have the opportunity to unfold our creativity, and that requires freedom. This is what I believe in. On, on the other hand, I also realize that we're, in a sense, as humanity, sharing uh, a common fate, uh, in a sense, uh, one could say we're all sitting in one boat, and that boat is called planet Earth. And so... We should not see ourselves just individually, but as part as huma of humanity. And through the internet, of course, we are all network anyway. So in a sense, we are forming something like a super organism. Now, some people say yes, and that's why we're building this super intelligent brain that would tell all the cells, which would be us, uh, what we have to do. I, I don't think this is the right approach because it would be maximally irresilient and uh, very vulnerable and um, it would take away a lot of the diversity and creativity. So that's not, not the way, but we need to realize that on the long run, we can only be doing well if we pay attention to our neighbors and how they're doing. And in a globalized world, Anything that happens in Africa, for example, or in South America or Asia would also impact 
our life sooner or later. So we need to learn that we need to find a way of um, interacting with each other, which is fair and respectful. And uh, we would all benefiting from each other and help each other in a sense, right? I mean, everyone, uh, so to say, within their own neighborhood. But uh, that's the point. So you, you wouldn't actually take away a finger of your body, right? That doesn't make sense. And if we consider humanity to be one big interconnected organism, then also everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a role to play and there needs to be space for them to play their role, right? And, and I see the value. I see where it's going. And I think that is the way we need to head. But how do we head towards a more utopian type world when there are the kinds of challenges that we have today and governments have a monopoly on force and innovators in Africa have to do whatever it takes just to survive? Yeah, I mean, from the point of view of evolution game theory, we can learn that um, systems tend to evolve optimally when there is um, symmetry. So I think fairness is really one important uh, point. Also, it's important that we would unleash human potential. I mean, everyone's individual potential. And that means we need to put less constraints on everyone's life. Uh, we start from the way we, we earn money and basically get access to the resources that we need, food, drink, apartment, and, and all the resources that are needed for the projects that we'd like to engage in, right? So we need to have more flexible solutions for access to these resources. Hey, Matt here. While we didn't directly discuss healthcare in the show, this is something that I would have liked to have brought up and I'm bringing up here now. One of the major challenges that faces especially Americans and people living without universal basic health care, is the problem of being tied to a job. When we have innovators that have no health insurance and aren't able to afford premiums or the cost associated with staying healthy, it becomes near impossible to spur innovation and creativity. When healthcare is the shackle that holds you to a job, then that's something preventing the next Einstein or Larry Page from going on and doing incredible things and changing the world. Looking at a system like this, which is a very Swiss-centric approach, one I would personally advocate for, of universal basic health care, allows anyone, regardless of job status, to be able to have that safety net, not be worried about being bankrupted by having to go to an overly expensive hospital, and have that allowing innovators to take larger risks, which is really what drives humanity, technology, and progress forward. And that will be to the benefit of society all together. I think... Laws will be eventually replaced by a measurement-based approaches. So the main point, the main one commandment in a sense or law is don't harm others, don't harm nature as much as that can be done. So harming can be measured with the Internet of Things. And we can basically create something like artificial resistance against those kind of actions that would create harm. And all the other things we would be free to do, right? Well, today, now we're not free to do certain kinds of things. If we uh, produce this or that, it has to be done in a very specific way. And uh, there are a lot of ways that are not allowed. Because uh, we, we have uh, created laws and regulations for this. And the question is, is it really reasonable or is it not uh, putting too many obstacles into the way? And a lot of people complain about over-regulation. Now, this law based system that has served us for a long time. We had the industrial revolution. A lot of automation was happening. A lot of people were losing their jobs. Then politics stepped in and said, okay, we cannot just let it happen. And they were imposing laws on companies and requiring certain quality standards and social standards and so on, which were forcing companies to make additional investments and employ new people to fulfill these laws and regulations and so on. And so the automation that has happened through the innovation of the companies has been compensated in many cases by laws and regulations requiring to again find new employ new people to um, fulfill those laws. And now we're getting into a situation where AI systems and robots can do all those standard things that we have to do today in what we call administration, right? Fill in forms, do things that are repetitive, 
that are based on certain kind of regularities and laws, all of that can, in perspective, be done by AI systems. And all of the people who have been doing these kind of jobs will potentially be laid off and will be unemployed. So as we are entering the time of super intelligent systems, yeah, there is no, no need for humans to do these kind of things. So this purpose of laws and regulations to make sure society is balanced, everyone, um, at least enough people have sufficiently work and income and so on, and quality standards arise. This is not going to work anymore. And we'll have robot uh, lawyers and, and all these kind of things, you know. So we'll have a new system anyway. And I, I think this will be based on Internet of Things technology that measures the impact of our action. And the rule is you can do anything you like, just don't harm anybody and we'll measure the harm. And uh, we would give people feedback if they were about to do something that would harm other people and put, uh, create some resistance. So they wouldn't do stupid things. And we would, in this way, learn to live in peace with each other because um, if we go in war, that harms other people, right? So that would create resistance. <laughs> so it would be a coordination system for helping us to um, make sure that as we unfold our talents, we're not going to step on each other's feet too much. And uh, there will be systems that support cooperation and, and projects and all this. And this is how I imagine our future would work very much self-determined, very creative, uh, very much based on doing things together, very much based on combining um, competition for best ideas with openness and cooperation and combinatorial innovation. So it's not anymore about one group of society against another one or USA. A, a USA against China or Russia or about these kind of, of things because we will learn that with information technology we can organize us in a way that we would benefit much more from cooperating with each other than from going on war with each other. So it will be a principle that allows the world to grow together in a peaceful way to benefit and to take the next step away from the material age that we have been living in for a long time into a more and more immaterial age because information is kind of immaterial in nature. They're not these strict constraints that we have with materials where there's just a certain amount of it. And so basically competition implies that you would try to get as much as possible. So we would all play monopoly. We would uh, try to, to have as much uh, of it as we can have and take it away from others and that creates conflict and war. No, when it comes to information, we can make as many copies as we like. We can come up with a plan of a house over here and print out the house with a special 3D printer in Africa or in South America or in any place. All of this uh, possible, we can make as many copies as we want, we can make as many variations as we want, so we have unlimited possibilities to create new values in the digital realm. So we don't have to be uh, taking things away from each other. It, it's much more helpful uh, to, to share data and, and algorithm, learn from each other and make quick progress towards a totally new civilization that would be enabled with this kind of technology. And I think we're just in the beginning of this process and uh, this is going to happen. I want to jump into something you brought up earlier, which was interesting. The idea of it wasn't exactly what you were proposing, but the idea of letting citizens distribute their taxes as they thought necessary or thought important. Your idea was more crowdsourced money, i.e. like a, a blockchain project that creates fake money and then seeds the community with money so that they're able to get the system going. But that could be also interesting to just look at a different system of running taxes where individuals controlled what their taxes were spent on. A set proportion had to go towards uh, essentially, you're still getting taxed. You still have to choose local projects, etc. But you got to choose in a more or less a direct democracy type system. Yeah, I, I think in the end, uh, the system that creates um, the least resistance and inefficiency might be the best over here. At the moment, of course, we are far off from this. We don't have the platforms to or to decide in a participatory way how our taxes would be spent. In many cases, also, there's not 
been of public money to spend um, on many things, and so um, also public institutions are not very innovative um, by design. And uh, I think that has to change basically. So we have quite a few serious problems in the world, and this is the sustainability problem. This is potential energy shortages, water shortages, shortages of other resources, uh, conflicts and mass migration resulting from that, and terrorism also resulting from this. So yeah, we we, we need to fix this, and we have. Uh, two traditional approaches to do that. Number one is nation states and the United Nations. Which is failing miserably. They don't have enough money really to create the solutions and uh, and there's also too much competition between the nation states and the veto powers and so on. And then on the other hand, we have global corporations and they said, look politicians, you can't fix it, so give us all the power. And uh, we'll do it, but in the end, uh, they focus on maximizing profits, and we don't see that the, the problems of the world have been solved. And so we need a third approach, I think, and I recommend it would be a bottom-up approach centered around cities and networks of cities. And uh, I suggest to have so-called city Olympics or city challenges where cities would spend some money on a competition between cities where all the people and stakeholders who were interested in participating could make a contribution to solutions for reducing climate change, um, coming up with more energy efficient solutions, um, coming up with sustainable solutions, with resilience, with peace, whatever matters could be a discipline of that Olympic competition. And so every city would come up with some proposal, with some solutions, uh, would be kind of a Mega hackathon, a citizen science project on a large scale would extend over several months. And, and then we would compare solutions. We would learn from each other and uh, maybe combine some of the solutions, develop them further because those solutions would be open source and creative commons. And as I said, um, all the stakeholders, that means uh, scientists and engineers, the media, businesses, politics, uh, uh, civil society, they could all contribute. We would mobilize in the very sense the ideas and resources of our society towards shared goals. I think we more or less all have on this planet, and many of them at least we share. And then we would come up with a diversity of solutions. So it would be very experimental, we would combine intelligent design with evolutionary principles and and in this way, I think we would really make very quick progress. So it would not just be about competition, but also about cooperation, because there would be this stage where we compare the different solutions and we come up with a best off list. And every city would pick the solution that fits their city best. And there would be networks of cities that share different uh, more or less the same problems, such as cities at the water waterfront or uh, cities in the desert, large cities or small cities. So basically, yeah, they they would create interest groups and networks, global networks, where they would share solutions and develop those solutions forward together. Of course, that's creative commons and open source, so everyone can take it and uh, really develop it further, offer services. So uh, it would be good for small and medium-sized companies, big companies, spin-off companies, scientists, and so on. So I want to I want to transition a little bit and look at other convergent technologies, where we're headed, and what you're most excited about. So outside of AI, what technologies most excite you today? I well, there there is of course a, a lot of technology that that has uh, potentials. Let's say virtual reality, right? So if you want to overcome conflict, then it's important that we understand each other much better. And we need to be able to put each other into, uh, to, to put ourselves into each other's shoes. And that can be done with virtual re reality very well, I believe. So sometimes what I'd like to do is I would like to use a search engine to see the world from different perspectives, right? Like, um, from, a U.S. perspective or a German perspective or Swiss perspective or Brazilian perspective or you name it, or from a male perspective, a female perspective, a Jewish, a Christian, a Muslim, or 
Hindu or atheist perspective. So all of that could in principle be done using specific filters of for information that would create those different perspectives and it could be visualized also with virtual reality uh, technology. So like if you go through the city and I go through the very same city, take the same roads, we would look at different buildings, different people. And uh, this is because we have different cultural backgrounds and um, have been raised in different contexts and so on. But in, in principle, I could share my view with you. You could share your view with me and it would help us to understand each other. And I think um, virtual reality technology has this potential to make help us make understand each other much better and I will uh, be able to help promote peace. Uh, that's, that's number one. Augmented uh, reality, of course, is also a wonderful thing. I'd like to see what you can do with uh, quantum computing. Altogether, the problem I'm seeing with a lot of these technologies is there is not enough participation. Like when it comes to big data, we are pretty restricted as scientists regarding the data sets that we can access and evaluate. So we would love to make a bigger contribution to the to solving the problems of the world, but we're restricted because we don't have enough access to data. Same thing with AI tools. We, we could be so much more efficient if we had aggregation tools that basically summarize all the new literature in a field and tell me. And besides, I would recommend you, your vineyard focus, to read these three particular new articles. Or have you been aware of this controversy, which is cooking up, you know, what's your opinion on this? So uh, we could be supported by, by the AI system without uh, really uh, imposing a certain perspective on us. The combination of blockchain and Internet of Things, I think, will be ext extremely important. I also think we need to take uh, blockchain to the next level different kinds of blockchain, blockchains that uh, can forget, blockchains that uh, are even more decentralized, that uh, they are not requiring the agreement of 51% for a transaction to be approved, but uh, it could basically randomly pick some witnesses and if they all agree about the transaction that has happened, that would probably be enough and much more energy efficient if you do such a thing. So you know, I think there's a lot of potential to take the idea of blockchain further and to, to vary its properties according to the, our societal goals and needs and also depending on the application area because in different application areas you might want to use different kinds of blockchain with different kinds of, of properties and, and so on. I'm a little bit worried about nanotechnology um, because it's difficult really for people to control it. In, in principle, it's possible, of course, to expose ourselves to nanoparticles particles and we would drink them or we would eat them with our food and they would somehow be distributed in our body. And then it's possible to interact with those nanoparticles through radiation and maybe 5G networks. But that's something that needs to be looked into because uh, it could really have external impacts on our body and brain and thinking. And uh, there is the potential that uh, it would have undesired impacts on our brain and body and health if we, the people, don't have the control of our personal lives, right? And uh, how this technology acts on our body and or on our lives. So... Informational self-determination, I think, will be a, techno not a technological challenge in itself. Uh, to bring it on the way, I consider it very important if we want to have a free and creative life. And these are the kind of things that I advise. And um, there is also a new direction of thinking, which is called design for values. And I consider this very much interesting too, because the, the point is that in the past, as we have been more intelligent than computers, we had to adapt to computers, right? And as computers get more intelligent than people, they should adapt to us. They should adapt also to our cultures. That means we should have our values 
the constitutional values, social values, ecological values, cultural values built into those platforms. Those platforms should adapt to us. And, and that's something that we need to learn how to build democracy in, how to build human rights and human dignity in and these kind of things. And maybe there will be new things, right? But learning to design for values will be, I believe, very important and will be a big market too. So this comes to my mind and probably there are many more things, but we could talk about this forever. It's one of those things where it inspires so many different tangents and conversations. But I know uh, I know you need to get going pretty soon. Basically, what it boils yes. down to is humanity needs to come up with better systems to both manage and incentivize the right types of behavior. And that's up. That's our short and summary. Where's the best place for people to find you, Dirk? Just on the internet. Search for Dirk Calvin. There's a web page. Um, there's an email. So uh, there's also the Future ICT blog and YouTube channel as well. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. This has been fun. If you want more of Fringe FM, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or go to fringe.fm where you'll find tons of audio and video interviews with leaders in the fields of genetics, cryptocurrency, longevity, AI, space, VR, and much, much more. And you can follow me on Twitter at It's Matt Ward. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a quick review in iTunes to help more people discover Fringe FM. 